Good evening. I'm Karen Lawrence, president of the Huntington Library Art Museum and Botanical Gardens. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our inaugural Centennial President Series event. 100 years ago, Henry Huntington envisioned a future in which the Pacific Coast will be the center of culture extending around the world. As we planned our slate of centennial events here at the Huntington, it was important for us to celebrate how our region has become a global center for the creative arts and humanities in a way that even Henry Huntington couldn't have imagined. In the library book, Susan Orlean also speaks of the promise of California. She writes, in the chemical makeup of Los Angeles, possibility was an element like oxygen. With the Centennial President Series, we'll be staging dialogues, performances, and an array of other programs that shed fresh light on the vibrancy and relevance of the humanities in the 21st century. We intend these events to bring new perspectives to the beloved collections under our care, serve as the occasion for creative collaboration, and extend our invitation for audiences old and new, near and far, to be a part of the Huntington community as we look to our next 100 years. I want to thank the generous sponsors of our year-long centennial celebration, Lisa and Tim Sloan, Terry and Jerry Cole, and Avery and Andy Barth. Tonight's event is just one part of what they have enabled. Tonight, we all have the pleasure of hearing from two of the most gripping contemporary writers working today, Viet Tang Nguyen and Susan Orlean. While their recent books, Orleans the Library Book and Wins the Sympathizer, seem on the surface very different, we wanted to invite them to share the stage together tonight to discuss some unexpected resonances. Although these books center on very different historical events, they both focus on the role of memory and forgetting in the writing of history. And both authors take up the culture, history, and people of Southern California in their respective books, though to vastly divergent effect. So I'm very pleased to welcome these two important writers and astute cultural analysts to the Huntington. I'd never met Via Tan Nguyen before today, although I just learned in conversation with him before that we were at an event together, a Vietnamese film festival at UC Irvine a number of years ago. Meeting him as well as reading him leads me to say we are all in for a real treat. I have had the pleasure of meeting Susan Orlean previously at a dinner party last year given by mutual friends. Our host that evening, Norman Pfeiffer, in fact, appears on page 18 of the library book. Norman is the architect whose firm had been chosen to renovate the LA Public Library, and ironically was there on that fateful day of the fire to discuss plans for the library's renovation. It's a pleasure to welcome our own Bill Deverell to the stage to introduce our speakers in a bit more detail and to moderate the discussion. Bill, as most of you know, is a professor of history at USC and the innovative director of the Huntington USC Institute on California and the West. I now give you Bill Deverell and our panelists. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Karen. Uh, congratulations to the Huntington and to you for launching this innovative and important series. 
It's really a professional and personal pleasure to be up here tonight uh, to help launch the series as the moderator. We could use all our time if I were to cover the bases of our guests' distinctions, honors, and awards. So let me just cut right to the chase. These are two of the most gifted writers and thinkers of our time. We're going to talk together for about 40 minutes. Then there's time for a few questions, three, as we planned it, <laughs> after which we'll adjourn so our guests can sign books. My friend and USC colleague, Viet Nguyen, of the English American Studies and Comparative Literature Departments, is a scholar, a professor, a novelist, a short story writer, and a textbook writer, among other talents. He's known best for his Pulitzer Prize winning The Sympathizer. His output as a fiction writer is matched by his publications in scholarship on Asia diasporas, on immigration, on the Trans-Pacific, on Asian American literature and politics. He is an award-winning teacher of both undergraduate and doctoral students, and he is a MacArthur Fellow. Susan Orlean has been a staff writer for The New Yorker since the early 1990s. We met over leisurely and wonderful chat on the patio of the Huntington's 1919 restaurant several months ago. Susan has written for other such publications as Vogue, Rolling Stone, Esquire, Spy, and Outside Magazine. Her work has become the basis for films. Best known among these is The Orchid Thief, but also Blue Crush, which began as a piece about young surfer girls in Maui. She's been an editor of Best American Essays and Best American Travel Writing, and she's been awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. She's the author of the library book, which is a deeply researched tribute to libraries, to librarians and to archivists and curators, to Los Angeles, and an arson and detective story all rolled into one. It's best to stop here. It was difficult for me to make these introductions even that short. Suffice to say that these are fascinating people who write fascinating books and essays. Here we are, a short walk to one of the world's greatest libraries, with storage facilities literally under our feet. Susan Viet, thanks so much for being with us. Susan, you've written movingly about libraries, uh, about your own imagination and coming of age in and because of them. But if I can, let me start with my colleague Viet. Can you tell us about your own experience with libraries, your experience in them or with them, either as a student doing all that post high school training at Berkeley, or even now, how do they figure into your work, even into your teaching? Well, it's funny thing is I was listening to Susan read her book, uh, the library book, and in describing what she saw there, it brought me back to my own childhood. You were talking about how at the Central Library, you, you go early in the morning, there would always, always be a crowd of people waiting to get in. And I grew up in San Jose, California, and I was one of those people at the San Jose Public Library, at the main library. I would, you know, I, I love the libraries because I come from a refugee background. And what that means is that my parents were always working, you know, 12 to 14 hour days almost every day of the year. And my refuge was in stories and in libraries. And so after schools and on the weekends, I would just get myself to the library uh, and then get there early and spend all day in, in, the, in the public library. It was very formative for me because it was my other education besides schools. And the great thing about a public library is that there are no borders and there are no boundaries. So you might have a children's section, young adult section, adult section, and so on. But if you're 10 or 12, you can go throughout and explore whatever you want, which is basically what happened to me. I would start off with Curious George and Tintin comic books, and then I would go on to you know, Sherlock Holmes and Encyclopedia Brown. And then the dangerous stuff <laughs> started to happen. And by the time I was 12, I was reading what we would consider to be adult fiction. So I was, because I came from the Vietnam War, I was very curious about wars. I read All Quiet on the Western Front at 12, and then I read Vietnam War fiction around that same time. And I was much too young to read Vietnam War fiction because it introduced a lot of violence and sex into my imagination. And then it was a short step over into another section of the library, and God bless librarians, the softcore pornography, which was... <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and all of that, and reading Philip Roth, Portnoy's Complaint, if you read The Sympathizer, you'll see some allusions. All of that eventually made, it, made its way into my fiction. So libraries are absolutely fundamental. And the other last thing I'll say about this is that there's a real distinction between public libraries and academic and research libraries. So I grew up in public libraries, but I spent the last 20 plus years in academic and research libraries like this one, which are very fancy, they're sites of privilege. 
but they're also sites of isolation because we don't get the full public exposure that we would go into something like the, the Central Public Library or any branch library in LA or Pasadena that you can imagine. So I bring my son, who's six years old, to public libraries now. It's always a shock for me to go into them. I'm like, oh my God, people are talking in the library. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good. These are democratic spaces, and we don't have enough democratic spaces in yeah. the United States yeah. today. Thank you. How about you, Susan? Just by either your way of your own upbringing or even more recent experiences, for instance, with your son, if you care to speak about that. The, this book really came about through being reminded of these many, many trips to the library with my mother. And I was fascinated, and this was triggered by a trip to the library with my son, having this moment of feeling that I was being sent backward in time and re-experiencing all those trips with my mother. What really made me curious was I went lots of places with my mother. And I don't walk into grocery stores and have epiphanies and think, oh my God, this is just like going to the grocery store with my mom. <laughs> but there was something about going to the library with my mother. And the, in fact, it was interesting because we went together, but I was allowed to go, as you're saying, off on my own. My mother didn't hover over me. I went, even when I was five years old, to the part of the library that interested me. And I felt a freedom that really kids at that age aren't allowed to go off on their own really anywhere. So this was a sense of freedom, a sense of, of a kind of magic unfolding, this idea that you never knew what you were gonna find. And the fact that there was no commerce being conducted was very important because if I went to a store with my mom, it would be like, no, you can pick one. And in the library, it was like, take 20. And when you're a kid, that's part of the magic, too. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, I'm taking things and leaving and not paying. Right, right. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so there was a resonance about those memories and a, a, a kind of... Um, depth and emotion to those memories that made me very curious about that this fundamental question, why do libraries and books mean so much to us? Why do they move us in a way that, that few other places do? Right. Um, and it's, you know, there are of course places filled with beauty and there are museums and there are magical places, but libraries have a unique kind of hold on us. And I think it's some sense of the human story being shared over and over again and having our own story playing out in this, this land of stories. Right. So it, it, it is in the best sense a sort of echoing of the human experience that I think you feel even when you're very young that feeling that you take a book off a shelf and there's, this, there's a whole world in it. Mm. And that is something that I think for children and then one hopes onward in, through adulthood, um, that's transformative. And which is why the, the publicness of a public library is so important. Yeah. Everybody should be able to have that experience of transformation and, and um, this access to the world of knowledge and imagination. Yeah. I think for those of us who are writers, you know, we spent our childhoods in libraries, and so we associate the magic of childhood with the magic of libraries as well. Because I, I remember also, I would bring a backpack to the library every weekend, stuff it full of books, and then I'd read all of them. Yeah. by the next week. My brother actually got upset. My brother is seven years old. He's like, why are you reading so many books? I'm like, are you, why, are you, why are you complaining about this? This is awesome. I was reading a book a day. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, and, well, yeah. and that's a kind of amazing bounty that you don't really feel anywhere else. Right. It, it's, and the idea that you can just keep devouring another mm -hmm. story and another story. And I do think when you're a kid in particular, 
that is a, a, a sense of enchantment and, and also freedom mm -hmm. that you can go into any world that it's just there for you. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a, a kind of agency that is so important for yeah. kids. I think that formative nature of a writer's youth, we're surrounded by remarkable scholars here at the Huntington every given day, and I bet every single one of them can tell that same story about being turned on to books and turned on to learning by being immersed in libraries as kids. Yeah. Can and, I switch and, gears first? Oh, know, go ahead. I will just say one thing, because I love bookstores, but it's interesting that most people's profound emotional connection to books, they think of in libraries. Mm -hmm and not so much. I mean, people love books, I love bookstores, but that feeling of access is very particular to a library, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, if I can shift gears a little bit and talk about writerly genres. You both write so beautifully, but you're boundary busters. Um, essays become books, nonfiction books read like novels, and whodunits, short stories, share space with scholarly interventions. Was this always the case? Did you always feel as if genre boundaries of writing had no place in holding you back? I used to fantasize that I would someday find a beat and just be able to cover a beat. And because I thought, well, that, that would be so comforting, like I would actually know something about what I was writing about. <laughs> and instead, I kept being drawn repeatedly to things I, where the challenge was that I had to become a student, but also that the stories that I, I thought were absolutely riveting and exciting were stories that, on the face of it, were the opposite. I mean, that, that they didn't fall into this typical category of what made an exciting, interesting story. So, I mean, the, my first job as a writer, I was assigned, I was working on a little newspaper in Portland, Oregon, and my boss said to me, okay, you're covering county government. And I, my very first story was about amyl nitrate poppers and how people were using them as recreational drugs. And my boss said to me, I thought you were covering county government. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, this is taking place in the county. <laughs> Which has a government. <laughs> and, yes, exactly. And, you know, after the second sort of experience of this same ilk, he said to me, you know what, just go do what you want to do. Um, so I would say that I have never found it easy to follow a template that existed. I just like writing about things that I find really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, my, my first experience writing was actually in the second or third grade, and it was related to libraries, too, because in the second or third grade, you know, we, ha we had the opportunity to, to write our own stories. And, you know, I wrote and drew and bound a book called Lester the Cat, and it was about, uh, you know, a city cat named Lester who gets bored, you know, has ennui with urban life, and then he runs off to the countryside and finds heterosexual romance. And I bet you could get that published. Ex-girlfriend has it, probably never see it again. But uh, you know, the, it won an award from the public library, and that was the first you know, sign that maybe I could do something as a storyteller. And what happened was that I became an academic like you, Bill, and, and, and you and I both know that academics oftentimes like to dig deep into the same subject. You, know, you can find academics who've written five or 10 books on the same subject. And I got a PhD, I wrote a book, and I was like, I cannot do this again. I cannot write a second book on the same subject. And so to answer your question, I think what, was, what really drives me is not the desire to go deep into one particular subject, but the desire to tell stories that are meaningful to me in some way. And I grew up as this refugee, as a Vietnamese American, as an Asian American, very aware intuitively that stories mattered because all I had to do was turn on the TV or watch a movie and realize that we as Asian Americans or Vietnamese or refugees were completely erased 
from storytelling and from American representation. And that's a very common experience for many of us who are minorities or from marginalized communities. So I think my first interest was always in the act of storytelling as an act of justice or injustice. And I really wanted to be a storyteller who could do justice to things. And so that's, that's why I've you know, did, done different things, from writing short stories to novels to scholarship to writing op-eds for different newspapers and so on, because I'm interested in doing, using whatever venue and genre I can to get to telling the stories about the people and the issues that I care about, and most often people, and people who, who, are, who have been suppressed, who have been forgotten, the people we're putting in camps, the people we ignore because they're trying to cross borders. These types of stories to me are, are universal, they're deep, they're, they're ongoing, they characterize my existence as a child, and they're still happening today. That's what drives me out. But what's fascinating about the two of you, <laughs> storytelling in both of your works um, needn't be marginalized or put into the fiction box. Storytelling is universal across whatever uh, genre you're writing in fiction, nonfiction, short story, novels, etc. Yeah. Can I ask you both, um, if you can substitute the theme of libraries and the ways in which libraries play a role in your imaginations and play roles in your work or your formative um, growth as writers, substitute libraries for me, maybe particularly with the library book and the sympathizer, for Southern California. In other words, how does Southern California figure into your literary or writerly imaginations as a character or something that puzzles you that you want to figure out? I had begun this book um, really right when I moved to L.A. It was a place that I had visited many times, but it, it, I had never lived here, and I certainly knew it only as a visitor. And in fact, um, my son was starting first grade and had a school assignment, and he was supposed to interview someone who worked for the city. I had suggested he speak to a garbage collector, and he suggested that he speak to a librarian. Um, and I thought, I'm a really good mother. <laughs> obviously figured that one out. Um, but we didn't even know where the nearest branch library was. So just by way of saying, we were really new here. Plunging into a story that was absolutely a Southern California, LA story that involved history that I didn't know at all, a, a kind of nuance about life here that I didn't know, I really didn't know yet. Um, it was very much a character and it was part of the process of me coming to feel that this was where I lived. I mean, you could say it was sort of a sneaky way of getting to know Los Angeles. But this story, you could say, well, you could write about a library fire anywhere, but there were particulars to this story, this city, that distinguished it. And also, unfortunately, in a very timely way, fire is a character in the Los Angeles consciousness the way it isn't in most other places. So, and that was something I was very aware of, that I had never thought about fire before. And suddenly I was living somewhere where the awareness of fire, it was like a wild animal that was just lurking and ready to pounce. And it, it was very much part of the character. So to me it was, um, this was, absolutely a book that was universal but also extremely specific to this place, this city, this history. And immersing myself in it was, was part of the experience of writing it. Yeah, it's brilliantly researched on the history of LA. Well, hearing that yeah. from somebody yeah. who's a brilliant researcher, I'm flattered no, because it it's very intimidating to be writing. I mean, also there is an, a, a huge amount of brilliant writing about LA. So even taking on the subject was really intimidating. And, you know, I had a stack higher than this of all of these great histories of LA. And I would think, what am I doing? How can I do this? I mean, I'm new here, but 
being new here is actually sort of fitting. That is, we're all new here. And so the experience of writing about this place as a newcomer, to me, that was where I was able to have some confidence of thinking that's the very nature of the place, mm -hmm. that we are all new here. Mm -hmm. So Viet, how about for you? Southern California, Orange County, LA County, Occidental College, they all figure in. Tell us a little bit Well, about you know, that. I grew up in, in San Jose, and then I went to school at Berkeley. So all my formative years were spent in Northern California. And what you got to know is that in Northern California, we don't think highly of Southern California. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so then I reluctantly took a job at USC in 1997. And what I discovered here is that Southern Californians don't think of Northern California at all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And, and, I, and I, I actually had no intention of staying. You know, my ambition was to make my way back to Berkeley or the Bay Area. That was my dream. But I've been here 22 years now, or 23 years, and I've completely converted to Southern California. Um, yeah, and, and Pasadena. And I, run, I spent 22 years, uh, 17 years in Silver Lake and five years living at the USC campus. And then last year I moved here to Pasadena, uh, mostly because I felt I got kind of old and I wanted the peace and the quiet of, of Pasadena. Um, <laughs> You guys aren't hip, but it's very, it's very peaceful out here. Uh, but basically what it meant was that, like you, I was a newcomer to LA, and I, I certainly had stereotypes about Los Angeles, and seen the movies, and read the books and everything, and when it came time to write The Sympathizer, I knew I wanted to set it in Los Angeles, because by then, I'd been living in LA for 15 some years, 20 years, and I thought it's just a much more exciting setting for what I wanted to do than the Bay Area would have been. Because I wanted to incorporate the history of representation about how America has imagined Vietnam and the Vietnam War, and what better way to do it than to set the book in LA and incorporate Hollywood into the book. And then I had to make a very strategic series of decisions about settings. And I did not, I, I, I was going to include Hollywood and LA people, I mean, producers and that kind of thing, but I didn't want the entire book to be as if it was entourage and only take place on the west side. <laughs> um, and so it was, I was very careful to try to pick a diversity of settings. So as you mentioned, you know, the, the, the protagonist of the novel lives in Echo Park uh, on, off of Sunset Boulevard in a neighborhood very much like mine. I chose Occidental College versus UCLA or USC because people, people wouldn't have heard of Occidental College for the most part. And then I extended the LA setting all the way to Orange County in places like Westminster. And so I wanted to have this, you know, this sense of LA as being greater than, than the white parts of Los Angeles. <laughs> Honestly, the white parts of, of Los Angeles. Right. Um, <laughs> anything west of the 405. And uh, that, because that's, that to me is what makes LA interesting. As you're saying, it's a city that's incredibly diverse. It's a city with all kinds of newcomers. And all, it's a city where people are either arriving from someplace else or in a, or in a way they're returning to LA. If you mm -hmm. think about migrations to, to Los Angeles, oftentimes it's people who've been displaced to south of the border, now coming back north of the border. All kinds of wonderful fusions and tensions arrive. And that's part of what I wanted to capture yeah. in the novel. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Can we talk about, well, one of the glorious things among many about being here at the Huntington is to, to immerse yourself in the multiplicity of shapes and forms that books take over 500, 600 years. In other words, the books as works of art here, it's really spectacular. Can we talk a little bit about the shape and feel and even architecture of books? Because Susan, I know you played a role in the design of the library book, what you wanted from it. And how you wanted to, it to look and how you wanted it to be shaped. Can you tell us a little more about how that happened? I did feel that if you're going to write a book about libraries and books and call it the library book, it better be a pretty good looking book. <laughs> and I, from the beginning, I had this idea also that I didn't want anything mediating between the reader and the book. I didn't want a dust jacket. and it, this seems like a minor thing, but I, I absolutely wanted the book to just be an object that you were intimately connected with. And I didn't want any image on the cover. I just wanted the words. So, and I'm not a book designer, but I felt in this case, it was so 
vivid to me that it just had to be this this book that I didn't want it to look old fashioned, but I didn't I wanted it to feel timeless. Then we started having fun with um, some of the elements that were in the book, and I had begun each chapter with a list of four books that are in the LA Library, the current collection, um, that relate in some fashion to the chapter that would come after them. Because I wanted the reader to have the experience in the book that would replicate a little bit the way you experience a library, namely that you'd be browsing and then come upon the thing you were looking for. But along the way, you would perhaps see some other books that you would stop and think, wow, I never, never heard of that, or that's a strange book, or maybe I'll take that one on instead. So, you know, setting that up to look as much like old card catalog listings as we could was, you know, part of the enjoyment of it. And then the final sort of um, cherry on top was in the very last minute, the idea of putting a checkout card in the back. <laughs> and now I actually thought your they idea? were going to put, well, it was, I would like to say it's my idea. It was my husband's idea. And <laughs> I mean, I guess I can share in the glory of that. <laughs> but I thought they were going to put an actual checkout card in the back. Um, instead, it's a trompe l'oeil that looks so exactly like a checkout card that I thought it was. It was it's actually very funny, because we, we had a great time deciding what names we were going to put on the checkout card. <laughs> and I've had a few people say to me, wow, it's so crazy that you, your mom, your son, and Ray Bradbury all took the same book. <laughs> um, but, it, it, you know, it was really... I, I mean, I love the way a physical book looks, and I think book design is one of those marvelous, um, you know, great sort of genres of design that is such a delight. But this was so satisfying. And, and it was also, I think, so important because it really did need, it, it was a very meta cover and it, it had to serve the point of the book in a way that a cover, it, it was doing more work than a cover normally would right. do. And Viet, we're veterans of scholarly publishing, which is not usually high on the design quotient. No, um, do, you, do you have an image of the book as you write it, or do you, can you weigh in now on the design and look and shape of the book? Well, you know, uh, my, first academic, my first book was an academic book, and the design of the, it was horrible, basically. And then the second book was a sympathizer. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try to take charge here, mm -hmm. get a little more input. And my publisher actually asked me for my, my ideas about what the book should look like. So I did all this research. I sent them a bunch of ideas. They accepted none of them. And then the publisher asked me, okay, so what don't you want to happen on the book cover? I said, I don't want red and gold on the book cover. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, it's all red and gold. And uh, the reason why I didn't want red and gold is because these are stereotypical colors with Asian or Vietnamese books and everything. So when I first got the design, they sent it to me as a PDF, and I was actually depressed for an entire day. And the second, the second, the second part was there's, there's, a, there's a face on the cover of the book. And I didn't realize until the end of the day there was also the face on the cover of the book that really bothered me because it, I, and I finally realized what it was by the end of the day. The, the, it was an Asian man on the cover and he had a flat nose. And it just registered with me initially and I wasn't able to articulate it until later. And then I said, he's half French and half Vietnamese and you put a fully Vietnamese nose on his face. And I know this because I'm Vietnamese, so I recognize this nose, okay? <laughs> And so that was the one thing they agreed to change on the cover. They went back and they redid the nose. Um, but my editor told me, look, you know, oftentimes authors are not happy with the covers that they get. But basically he said, we know better. Yeah. Okay. And in the end, it was true. I mean, what, what can I say? I mean, the, novel, the book has been successful. I have no complaints. And now I'm acclimated to the cover of this book. By the way, just as yeah. a kind of um, correlate to this, 
I, the library book is the only book of mine that ever ended up with the same title that I had written it hmm. with. Every other book I've written, the title got changed because at the end, the publisher said to me, you know, we really like your book, but the title. Hmm. And often I would say, well, what's your suggestion? And then I would test on my friends, like, which do you like better? My title <laughs> or this horrible title that the publisher is suggesting? And, you know, I put people in very uncomfortable positions. But in many cases, I would actually think, look, I'm not a salesperson. I don't know what sells in terms of, or in the case of a, a cover design, certain, you know, if, if you have a cover a title that's long, it presents certain design problems. And so I did cave on, on all of these titles. And the library book was literally the only one where, from the beginning, we just all said, well, obviously that's what it's got to be called. So it was not a working title. It was always a title you thought suited the book best? Well, it's funny because it also sounds like the way you refer to books where you say, you know, I'm working on that library book. <laughs> and, but it was like, well, I'm working on that library book. Mm -hmm. and, it, but, and at the very end, I thought, is that too sort of straightforward? Mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, I thought, but that is what it is. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense and it's got sort of, you know, a nice double entendre. But... Everything else, I worked on with the idea that it was a working title, but that it was probably going to be what we'd end up with, and it never did. Well, here's another thing about book design, which is foreign editions. Yes. Uh, so one of the, one of the beautiful things uh, for me has been seeing all the foreign editions of, of something like The Sympathizer, for example. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of dozen or something like that. And it, I have no control over any of this. I just get, get them sent in the mail. And so when you're talking about the beauty of the design, it's just interesting to see what different uh, publishers in different countries think would be attractive or marketable for different national audiences. So it's, yeah. like, it's, getting, a, it's like getting a Christmas present yeah. every time the book shows up. And I just had a really funny experience, which was we all along thought, of course, the cover should be red. I mean, partly because lots of books are red and it seemed like the classic color of a book and the fact that this was about a fire and it just seemed like naturally it should be red. We never even considered another color. I just got the UK edition and it's bright blue. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think, uh, you know, there you go. I mean, uh, that's a perfect example of why we don't communicate as people is like they thought obviously like it's got to be bright blue um but it's been it's interesting and actually today i got the serbian uh, translation of the orchid thief and i mean it is it's really interesting to see what each country's interpretation i mean i always think why not use the same cover i've never understood that um though they have different um you know, different societies have different expectations in terms of design. And I did have a book that I, I was cleaning up my bookshelves recently, and I took a book off the shelf, and, I, and it was a language I didn't know. And I kept thinking, this must be a foreign edition mm -hmm. of one of my books, but I kept looking at it. It was a, a head with like a bird flying out of the head, and uh, what looked like a roller coaster in the the face, and I kept thinking, did I ever write a book about a, <laughs> a roller coaster and a bird? And I've obviously have forgotten. So I thought I've got to figure out what this is, <laughs> and it was the orchid thief. And I kept thinking, I'm trying, I I don't totally see how they got right, this. Right, right. I mean, it's very attractive. It just, to me, has nothing to do at all with the book. So, since you brought it up, can I ask what The Orchid Thief had been titled? Oh, my God. This is a highly sensitive subject. <laughs> I had found this gardening book from the 1920s, and the chapter about orchids was called The Millionaire's Hothouse. And I thought, that is the best title 
And I just thought that's what, I, the book is called The Millionaire's Hot House. And I was calling it that, I was, you know, telling everybody that's what it was called. Right before we're going into the final stages of editing, my publisher said, you know, love the book, one little problem. Don't love the title. And I said, but it's a fabulous title. And <laughs> he said, um, how about this? Just hear me out. The Orchid Thief. I said, that's the worst title <laughs> I have ever heard, ever. I'm not kidding. And he said, well, just sleep on it. And I did begin this process of polling my friends, saying, just honestly tell me, which do you like better? My title, The Millionaire's Hot House, or their stupid title, The Orchid Thief? And everybody was sort of squirming. And I kept thinking, come on, you guys, this is so obvious. Like, that is a horrible title. Finally, I just, I mean, they, they never pushed me, but they just kept saying, oh, I mean, we've really asked basically everyone in the United States. And, <laughs> and they really like this title. Yeah. <laughs> so I finally just said, whatever, just <laughs> fine. Call it what you want, but the first chapter is called The Millionaire's Hot House. So <laughs> I got it in there anyway. So can I ask both of you to reflect on, as writers, and pick your genre or format that you would care to speak to about this, Talk to us a little bit about early influences or individual scholars, writers, essayists, teachers who really got you thinking along the lines of, I'm going to try to do that. Oh, that's a hard question. I think there were so many. Um, maybe you want to start. Okay. Um, well, I would say the two influences for me uh, and they, they will sound like an odd pair, but the first one was William Faulkner. Um, I think reading The Sound and the Fury was a truly a watershed moment for me, where on every level, the language, the thinking, the emotion, the structure. I just thought this is the most magical thing anybody could do, and if I could ever do anything close to this, it, I would be thrilled. But the second, which was also really important, was reading Tom Wolfe and reading the electric acid Kool-Aid test, which when I was in high school, which was I think when I first read it, and I think this happened to a lot of people who were interested in pursuing nonfiction, this idea that you could have that freedom of language and structure but be writing nonfiction was, I carried that book around with me. I think I slept with it. I mean, I had it with me constantly and I would refer back to it all the time and just be rereading it and rereading it and marveling at it because it really was a masterpiece of reporting coupled with this, you know, very subjective but truthful perspective that I thought, I can't believe that you can do that. You can actually do that. And I want to do that. Thank you. Well, it's a hard question for me to answer because I, 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 I think the whole atmosphere of the library and of reading all kinds of books when I was growing up, all of that imbued me with this desire to tell stories. But and there were many writers that I admired, including you know, William Faulkner, Sound of the Fury, which I read in high school too. Um, but I remember very, dis very distinctly a moment uh, when I was about 18 or so, and I, and I went to, to Berkeley to visit the campus, and I went to Moe's Bookstore, I believe, and I found a book on the bookshelf there, just randomly browsing, and it had just come out, so it was still in hardcover. It was Amy Tan's The Joy Luck Club. Mm. And I had never seen a book by an Asian American author. I had seen books about Asia, like I had read The Good Earth, for example, uh, when I was in the second or third grade, I think. And, and then to, I, I, took, I bought that book, I went home, and I read it in about a night, maybe a night and a half. And I was just blown away. You know, n now maybe my opinions would be different. You know, Amy Tan has, has a sort of a complicated reputation among Asian American readers, but back then it was just mind-blowing for me to, to see a book with Asian American 
characters in it. Mm. And that opened up the possibility, oh, that we could, I could try to do something like this. And the second time something like that happened to me was in college or graduate school, college, and I read Sherman Alexie's short story, uh, This Is What It Means to Say Phoenix, Arizona, um, and published in Esquire. This is before it was included in a book called The Lone Ranger and Tonto, Fist Fight in Heaven. And in that book, in that story, it was simply the style. I was just enraptured. And, and I was in a creative writing class, and I thought, I, I'm going to try to write like Sherman Alexie. This is the first time I, I found someone who I thought, I want to try to imitate this mm -hmm. writer. And ironically, of course, I don't write anything like Amy Tan or Sherman Alexie, but it was simply something about that moment with those, sty with those stylists and the, the content that just triggered something in me emotionally that, that made me feel that they're doing something really, really important, and I want to try to replicate that for myself and for yeah. others. Thank you. If we could take you into the vaults at the Huntington um, to see some of the rarest of the rare, and this isn't a question about individual items, but what period, what themes, what histories or literary treasures might you find yourself attracted to? I became fascinated um, with World War I, partly when I was writing Rin Tin Tin, and you know, I, I began to realize that it's, I feel like it's a war that we don't know nearly as much about as certainly as Europeans do. Um, and I'd gone to Verdun when I was in, when I was reporting on that book, and I just became fascinated by that period. And actually, my favorite, probably the books that I think about the most are the, the trilogy that Pat Barker wrote about World War I. And to me, it's sort of when the modern world began, um, for better or worse. So it, it's the, any material related to that is probably what I would mm -hmm. gravitate to. Thank you. Well, when I was reading, researching The Sympathizer in, in a book on Nothing Ever Dies, I went to visit the Vietnam War archive at Texas Tech University, which is the biggest one in the country. And, you know, I got a tour of the archive from the archivist. And, you know, he said, oh, here are the books and all the materials and everything. But he said, we also have a safe where we keep the guns and the pornography. And I was like, I want to see the safe. You know, that was what I was doing. So, but you know, honestly, like particular periods don't interest me or, and, and things like first edition manuscripts of the Bible or Shakespeare, they're great to look at, but I, that's not really what interests me. What interests me is what I saw today. I got a little um, uh, display put on by the curators here. I was very lucky to do that. And I also had the same thing done at the New York Public Library as well. And what fascinated me in both of those were author's manuscripts. Uh, in New York Public Library, I got to see, you know, what James Baldwin had written when he was in high school. Uh, and here, I got to see Octavia Butler's manuscripts yeah. when she was writing here. And that's what I want to see. I want to see authors' creative processes. I, I want to see what they were doing when they were young. I want to see what they, what they struck out, what kind of notes they took, that, what, what they were interested in. That, to me, is really yeah. fascinating. Fabulous. You know, um, we could sit up here all night and talk. It's just so fascinating. And you've helped launch this series with just a great exclamation point. We do owe the audience time for their questions. And then we'll adjourn for the book signing. Um, I have one final question. Um, could you write a book together? <laughs> okay. I'm going to go short here book, and take maybe. it. Yeah. Oh my god, I would love it. I, I mean. I'd love it. I don't know what we, it would be. As we turn I don't to you either. All, yeah. It doesn't matter. We just throw be, ideas back and forth. Yeah. I think. yeah. I'll repeat be the fantastic. question. Okay. Um, please join me in thanking these two wonderful, Thank wonderful writers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our experience in the room is that if you speak loudly, um, I'll hear your question, and so will our guests, but I'll repeat it for the audience. So we have time for three. There's one right there. Um, thank you for being here. I'm super a big fan of your writing, but also of the podcast you have on Friday. Um, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you are writing and how you think about writing. Um, so I wanted to ask both of you if there's been any reading that you've done in the last uh, year that ignited an uh, emotional response. Uh, Can I just repeat it, Susan? So yes, the sure. question is, is there any reading that you, either of you have done in the last year that has ignited an emotional response from, from the authors themselves? Yeah, okay. I um, have 
never cried as hard as I cried reading A God in Ruins, Kate Atkinson, um, which I read, I guess I read last year, and I literally was hysterical. At, and there was a point where my husband walked in the room and he thought something horrible had happened to me. And I, had, I couldn't speak and I just kept pointing at the book. <laughs> and he was like, what? But what's going on? Are you okay? Um, but yeah, boy, that, that is, um, and I recommend that book to many people and I always say, don't blame me if you're kind of a little teary at the end. Um, but yeah, I would say that that kind of ripped me apart. God, I hate those kinds of questions. My mind always goes blank. But um, uh, one, a book that did, that did strike me a lot, so much that I blurbed it, is a forthcoming book um, by Charles Yu um, called Interior Chinatown. Charles Yu, you know, I think he's now doing things like writing for Westworld, but he also has like three other books, uh, including you know, he's, he's this really kind of wonderful writer who brings together literary fiction and science fiction and experimental fiction. And so Interior Chinatown is a novel about the filmic version of Chinatown and the Chinese American actors have to, who have to live in that world. And so it, it inhabits the screenplays that are written about these kinds of characters so that we only know them as, you know, old Chinese man, for example, or young Chinese gangster. And so it's a very clever, funny novel, metafictional novel, about what it's like to both be an, an, a Chinese American actor condemned to these kinds of roles that you know, we're very familiar with up until very recently, and imbuing them with a human dimension. It's a very tragic dimension about what it means when your entire life is subjected to these kinds of racist, stereotypical kinds of representations. And of course, things are changing, um, but for much of the 20th century and you know, for through much of the early 21st century, this is how Asian Americans have had their lives defined. Another question. Yes, sir. I'm curious about the process you go through in writing. And that is, what happens when you get stuck? What happens when you need a break? What happens when you uh, just don't know where the next turn will go? I'd be fascinated to hear about your uh, process. So let me just repeat that. Um, the question's about writing process. So what? What do you do when you get stuck? What do you do when you get tired? What do you do when you don't know which direction or rhythm the project is taking? Well, I think this is probably something um, that is a little bit different between writing nonfiction and fiction. I mean, I think it's different for every writer, but when I get stuck, um, I generally think it's a reporting problem and not a writing problem. That the problem is I don't know enough yet and that I'm trying to write something that I, I don't know yet. So my sort of address in those situations is to not try to push through on the writing but to step back and think, okay, what, what is it that I don't, what am I trying to say, and what is it that I failed to learn to make this make sense on the page? So I, I do think, I mean, I think everybody gets stuck writing all the time, and there are times when you just have to close up shop for the day and go take a walk. But I, I would say in nonfiction, it's very often the case that you just you just need to go back and do more research. So, you know, um, I try to write every day when I have the time to do it, and then you have to stop at a certain point, whatever's healthy for you. Mine is about a three or four hour period, and then I go run. You're saying walk mm. away. You have, to, I, you have to walk away. I, I go run, and that really helps to clear the mind and helps to generate new ideas. But the other thing that's important is that I always have multiple writing projects going on. So if you look at my track record in the last few years, you might think, he's really prolific. He's published a book every year. Well, each of those books took about 10 to 15 years to write because I was working all, all of them at the same time. Um, and so whenever I would get stuck on one, I would move on to another. 
And even now, because I'm you know, writing a lot of op-eds and essays for periodicals and, and so on, I always have things, different things that I'm thinking about. So I might be writing a novel now, but I know I owe something to Time Magazine and it's been cooking in the back of my head. If it gets stuck with my novel, I can just take a diversion and write a 3,000 word essay for Time or a 1,000 word essay for the New York Times. That works for me, right? Because uh, for me, and maybe it's for you, true for you too, but a lot of the writing, sometimes it's very rational, it's very explicit but a lot of it is very implicit and very intuitive. And so you have to trust, or I have to trust, that somehow my subconscious is also working on these ideas as well. So I can just move away and do something and the back of my mind will keep on thinking about it. Yes. So what's your favorite place in Los Angeles and why? And if you explore something new every day, what is it and how do you do that? Yeah. How do you go about that, uh, that process of exploration? That's tough. Um, I, I mean, to be honest, my favorite place in LA right now is my house because <laughs> I've been <laughs> renovating a house for two and a half years and it actually is a historic landmark in the city, so there's something also kind of wonderful about learning the history of the house, and you know, I just, I really love it, and I mean, maybe that's weird that my house is my favorite place, but it's also probably a good thing that my house is my favorite place. Um, I don't, I would like to think that I explore something new every day. I'm not 100% sure that I can say that absolutely because a lot of my life is the routine stuff of taking my son to school and going to the dry cleaner and, you know, but I am always, I'm always gobbling up what I'm seeing. I feel like, to me, you know, I love not driving on the freeway and instead taking surface roads and just looking and looking and looking. And I think it, I like the, the ugly parts of LA. I like the gritty parts. I like the gorgeous San Marino parts. Um, but there's a quality of the gritty parts that I, I just love. And I find myself always, I'm just constantly rubbernecking. Um, even when I'm just going about doing the sort of routine stuff in my life. Strangely, my favorite place in LA is my home too. <laughs> <laughs> and um, usually I sign my book, The Refugees, by saying, may you always be at home. And the reason, one of the reasons why I do that is because for most of my life, I've never felt at home, even in my parents' house. So for me, home has always been a site of being ill at ease, uh, whether that's a physical house or whether it's the country, um, and I think a lot of it's due to being a refugee, but also having a complicated adolescence and all of that. Uh, and so the house that I just moved into last year here in Pasadena is the first house where I really feel that it's, it's fully mine. I earned this house. It's a place that is for me and my family, not for anybody else. And I feel completely comfortable in this home. It's a real home for me and not just a house. Uh, so that's really a weird feeling for me, and I'm, I'm trying to enjoy that. And yet, at the same time, I'm also preparing to leave, you know, because I'm a refugee. I'm like, you know, things get screwed up when we least expect it, right? And so I'm like, hey, I'm living in Trump's America. I got to be a little worried about how things are going to turn out. I'm, I apologize to everybody who, who did not like that comment. But uh, seriously, you know, I... I I'm, I'm, I'm serious, you know, I, I, I don't think my parents, my parents never expected to become refugees, even though it happened to them twice. Things change. And we're living in a time in which, you know, we're, we're closing the door on refugees, we're closing the door on immigrants, we're ratcheting up the pressure on people like this, we're trying to drive them out of our country, we are deporting Southeast Asian refugees for crimes that they committed 20 or 30 years ago. We're talking about denaturalization of people. Uh, and so I'm not born here. I'm a naturalized citizen, which means I can be denaturalized. Maybe some people, when I say this, people think, this is not going to happen. I'm like, I have to think that this can happen. So long story short, 
you know, I, I, I am sending my son to a French school so that he can become fluent in French in case we need to retire to France or make our escape to France. <laughs> you know, we've spent a, a few summers in the last few years in France and he's, you know, we've spent many months in, in Paris and I'm taking French classes five hours out of the week to get ready for this possibility of becoming an American refugee in France, you know? Uh, and that keeps me sharp, I hope. Because, it's, you know, it's, it's the, the, the bad thing about feeling at home is that you just get too comfortable. I'm afraid of that. Like, I think that's the worst thing that can happen to a writer is like, to feel too comfortable. So how can you not feel comfortable? You have to be alert to the dangers of the world, that things can become unsettled, and you have to learn new things, like you're saying. So for me, uh, going back to French and, and learning, ironically, my colonizer's language is another kind of adventure for me to confront. Because when I go to France, it's not to, to go there and eat croissant and to go and, and, and see where Sartre wrote his books and stuff. I'm not interested in that France. I'm interested in the France that looks like, you know, United States, because France is all screwed up too. And I'm writing a novel set in Paris in the early 1980s, and in The Sympathizer, I tried to offend everybody. In this book set in France, I'm trying to offend the French. You know, so this is how I learn, is like trying to equate, it's very easy to do, by the way. And uh, so, you know, as a writer, it's important to, to go into these things that I'm, you're not comfortable with and to challenge yourself. And that includes both, in this case, learning the language, but also trying to write a novel dealing with a completely different uh, situation. So we've reached the end of this part of the evening. I want to thank you all for coming um, and helping to launch this wonderful series. Thank you to President Lawrence for inventing this series. And please join me again in thanking our writers for inaugurating it. So wonderful. I'm taking you that way.